Welcome to Things You Don't Know. In this episode, we are delighted to have a special guest participant. This is an exceptional young man who has a podcast of his own and has traveled the globe giving motivational speeches. Now, he has cerebral palsy and, you know, he has some uh, difficulty with pronouncing things, but I do encourage you, really do encourage you to check out his podcast. It's called Zachary's Journey, which you can find at YouTube slash Zachary's Journey, all smushed together, dot com. He has some really important and encouraging things to say. So without further ado, we welcome Mr. Zachary Vasquez. Let me interrupt and add my welcome to my good friend, Zachary. I've known him for some time, and if I may, I'd like to add a few personal notes. Zach is a very kind, compassionate, intelligent, and driven person with a great sense of humor. He's overcome some challenging odds because he has a message that needs to be heard. I am very impressed that he has been an international success in public speaking despite having some speech impediments. Yes, my friends, the message does speak to those with disabilities, but it also speaks to those with any kind of self-doubt. I think the greatest achievement both of us have accomplished is to defeat our own doubts. Thank, thank you so much for having me. For this opportunity, um, I'm, I'm grateful to share my, my, my journey with, with your audience. Okay. Well, Zach, when were you first diagnosed with CP? And what, what variety of CP do you have? I have... Um, <laughs> It's called um, spastic. Oh, it's, it's a very variety, but it's difficult for my four joints to. Um, it's difficult for me to do, use my four joints. It's difficult for you to use your joints uh, with the uh, spastic diplasia, yeah? Despite my doctors, um, despite what my doctors say, despite the help from my parents, they encouraged me to keep going, and they just didn't give up on me. So um, I'm thankful for my parents to keep pushing me forward. Okay, and I understand at the uh, at around nine, um, you had some uh, some good experiences. What was that? So at the uh, at the age of nine, um, I started speaking for the very first time from my from my, my musical teeth. So Alyssa Kazaza. And she um, really inspired me. She inspired me to just open up. But without her encouragement, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for what she has done in my life. And I'll go into more detail a little later on. What would you say is the hardest challenge you face with your CP? The hardest challenge um, for me is like just to, um, despite my speech impediment, I was made fun of in my early years at elementary school. But I was teased and I was also bullied at one point. But I did like that despite me 
because I know I I know I have a speech impediment, but it it doesn't just discourage me in any way. Yes, and I I know that um, CP affects uh, individuals very differently, uh, and the challenges probably are varied depending on the person's specific needs and circumstances. Like some of the things that happened, as you as you mentioned, may include mo- mobility, motor function difficulties, communication and speech challenges, cognitive impairments, uh, which thankfully. Uh, is not the case for you, uh, seizures and uh, associated medical conditions. And and as you pointed out, the, the social stigma, the accessibility barriers and emotional well-being concerns can also impact uh, people with uh, CP and their families too. Yes. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's important to recognize and respect those u- unique experiences and strengths of individuals with CP and provide support and accommodations to promote inclusion and accessibility. One of the things that I find remarkable is that you have become a successful public speaker despite having some speech impairment. Why did you choose this goal? You have given speeches in the USA, China, Australia, the Middle East, and and many more. Uh, did you find it diff- more difficult in one place or another of these places? Um, not, not necessarily because um, I feel like if if you can connect with um, an audience that speaks in different language, it might be challenging, but nothing's challenging. Nothing is too over charity, if you know what I mean. Yes, I, I do. You can still achieve anything you want to achieve if you, if they speak a different language. Maybe it might be challenging to, to speak to the audience at first, but as you get familiarized with the language you they um get comfortable with your story and they look at you they look to you at your your personality and see what you had to offer despite your story what i've always been curious about zach is how you first became a public speaker <laughs> that is a good uh, question. At the age of three years old, I, I always wanted to share my message with people around the world, but I didn't know how to, to how to share my message with people around the world because I was despiteful because of my disability. Because I have a speech impediment, and also my my disability, I thought people wasn't gonna resonate with my story. But my friend Carlos Benjamin, he inspired me to never give up on um my journey, and also I met um somebody who also had a similar story because um, I lo- for people who don't know my story, I lost Carlos at, at the age of 14 and I, I did not know how to um, keep going with my public speaking because He's the one who inspired me to um, do my motivational speaking. And I used to do it with him, and um, I I found it very moving. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> just a few more um, personal questions before we move into the major focus of this podcast. I wonder, 
if you had any people you regard as mentors and were you involved in any program, uh, any programs such as the theater for everyone group that Dr. Deneen helps to run, which helped or hindered you in your journey? Um, there are so many mentors that I had throughout my journey, and I would like to acknowledge them all, but I can't acknowledge them all. So, I just to name a few, um, I had Christy Gutin who um, helped me um, with my um, who helped me in find my full potential in my story. He helped me like put the story together, and I I couldn't think of it. And Alyssa Gazaza, I would also like to acknowledge because without her support, I wouldn't be able to be a motivation speaker. And, and also with Dr. Janine, um, like Fear for Everyone program, I feel like there's, there needs to be more programs with, with, with people with disabilities because he is changing the world with his um, program. And I feel like there needs to be more programs with just to acknowledge that we don't have to do this alone. Indeed. That's what that's what I got from Sean Boger. Sean Boger is very encouraging others to just find what they're passionate about doing. And I'm very grateful to be a part of that program. We are grateful to have you, Zach. Um, you, you really are an asset, and you're very good at encouraging some of the other students as well. I'm curious, academically, um, did you go through the special ed experience as I did? And if so, did you find that a productive and good experience? Um, I, found, I found that a mixture of experience because I found, like, it was very... It was very good in the way because I was focusing on my academic skills, but also I did not like it because yeah. I felt a separation with 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 the children because of my special education needs. I also felt that um they that they did not give me, um, they did not challenge me in my needs because I felt like they could, they did not know if I was able to do it, so they didn't try it with me at first, and I felt that very discouraging, and I just wanted to give up. Well, if I can reaffirm what you're saying, sometimes there are wonderful teachers in that environment. I've been blessed with many. But it is extremely difficult to learn in an environment of extreme stress. I remember one class I had, students were taking their shirts off, throwing the desks out the window, and generally creating chaos, which made it impossible to learn. <laughs> yeah. So... I get what you're saying, uh, that you don't really prefer special education. And it, as you, as you told me, uh, that it, it tended to make you feel isolated and even maybe dumb sometimes. So, um, but I hate to put the teachers down because I have wonderful teachers in special education. So, yeah. So did I, they worked under impossible odds. Okay, although we have only scratched the surface of Zach's story, I want to move into some related areas. Let's explore 
some of the incorrect ideas concerning the varying exceptionalities uh, communities. I, I prefer that term, uh, varying exceptionalities, rather than disability. And the reason is because the term disabled conjures up inability, whereas varying exceptionality conveys differences rather than impairment and covers a wider area. The exceptionalities uh, community includes psychological, physical, identity, and other differences. Let's start off by exploring some myths about CP, cerebral palsy, uh, since I'm honored to have two people with me here uh, with life experiences in that area. First, there are several types of CP and symptoms run the gamut from mild to severe. There are uh, around a million, one million, a little more perhaps, with CP in the USA alone. Movement difficulties, spasticity, and body contortions are the most prevalent types of symptoms, closely followed by speech impediments and visual impairments, such as difficulty with depth perception and spatial uh, perception. One myth that is perpetuated by labels such as a brain damaged really has two different sequelae. One is that it means intellectually impaired. The other is that there is no possibility of improvement and that all people with CP require supervision and care. It is like the saying that you can't put toothpaste back in the tube. <laughs> You know, in the past, the medical community widely accepted that the brain can't heal. But that has been disproven. In my opinion, the problem in CP has more to do with connectivity than, than parts of the brain being dead. Connectivity rather than brain damage. Uh, it is true that the symptoms of CP are highly unlikely to completely disappear, but they can and often do improve to some extent. I would like to touch on what you just, what you said. Thank you for sharing this information. But I feel like um, bad professionals and people in the disabled community tend to um, be more active in um, the children's life because I feel like they don't really understand how it is to be disabled. So um, they they want to help the children any possible way that they can, but they kind of overdo it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. huh? And that's what I don't like about special education. In, in, in the real world, I would like to make a connection. In the real world, the world is not going to be over there's somebody not always going to be there to help your everyday needs. There, there is going to be some challenging times in anybody's life. It doesn't matter if you're disabled or anything. You're absolutely correct. You make a great point. Other, unrealistic expectations, whether overprotectiveness uh, can lead to very harmful attitudes, whether it's doing too much, uh, as we like to call it, infantilization, or on the other extreme, the idea that we just have to try harder and we could do everything if we wanted to. Willpower alone is an important factor, but it is not a complete solution for individuals with exceptionalities. I think it's important to realize and respect everyone's unique needs and abilities and provide support and accommodations 
within a self-directed environment to help each individual thrive. Oh, well, I like what you just said because what, what, what you just said is basically true. And I, I hate to put the special education people down because they did an excellent job. Okay, I want to jump in here. Uh, trying harder, especially according to the ableist idea, is one of the worst things in my experience of, of 45 years of working with, with people. Uh, it's one of the worst things that someone can do to somebody with ex exceptionality. Trying harder stresses and makes it more difficult many times. I couldn't agree more. I mean, sometimes if I'm working on something, I'm having difficulty. If I feel like I'm failing, it becomes even harder. I get physically tense and emotionally stressed, and then I'm able to do even less than before. May I jump in to what John just said? Sometimes we tend to overstimulate ourselves, and then we try, we give so much effort into what we are trying to do instead of doing having fun in what we are supposed to be doing we're, we're maybe focusing on like getting the task done and not enjoying what we are supposed to be doing uh, indeed uh, we mentioned um, ableism. Um, Dr. Deneen, perhaps you can say something about that? Certainly. Uh, it covers a great many things, whether it's harsh treatment of people with exceptionalities, but also specifically a lack of compliance with disability rights laws like the Rehab Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act and other guidelines. To give some concrete examples, these include things like segregating students with disabilities in separate schools when it's not needed, the use of seclusion, restraints, or unneeded medication as a means of controlling students with disabilities, segregating adults with disabilities uh, involuntarily in institutions, failure to incorporate physical accessibility into building design plans, buildings without braille on signs, elevators, buttons when they have an elevator, websites that are impossible to be accessed, the false idea that people with disabilities only need or want to be fixed. As my dear physical therapist, Dr. Andrew Kramer used to say, you cure me, not people. You disability as a punchline, seeing people only as objects of pity or mockery, refusing to provide reasonable accommodations in both education and in the workplace. The ultimate expression of this discriminatory and dangerous idea is the mass murder of disabled people in Nazi Germany, the eugenics movement in our own country, I'm sorry to say, in the 1900s, and a sort of weird paternalism which sees us as either objects of pity or people to be isolated and controlled at all costs. I wonder what causes even well-meaning people to sometimes adopt such thinking. Actually, that is a very interesting topic and really kind of the heart of what we wanted to do in this podcast. You know, there are many factors which contribute to ableism and why people adopt that kind of very misguided and yeah, bad sort of mindset. Factors that characterize and contribute to ableism include anxiety in unstructured social encounters, where non-disabled behave awkwardly around disabled people. Social and cultural conditions, such as norms like people who are familiar seem similar to me, they're good, and the rest of them, not so good. That's a very ableist sort of 
the framework, but it also goes to the thinking of the people who uh, show us ableism. Um, ableism can stem from attitudes you learn from your parents, peers, and even the media. Plenty of shows treat people with disabilities like they're, they're just like plot points or they're inspirational stories rather than actual human beings when they include them at all. Other factors which are not as publicized are fear of a person with a disability. For example, I remember back in the 50s uh, in particular, uh, people cautioning, you shouldn't get too close to the disabled because you might catch the disability. Wow. What, what, what a crazy notion. Another thing is that people without an exceptionality also feel that people with an exceptionality are a drag on society and accommodations are not a cost effective. A word about that. Let's look at some facts. 42.5 million people, 42.5 million people in the USA have a disability. That accounts for about 13% of the population. Okay, now, if you're being equitable in, in kind of sharing things and, and the wealth and whatnot, 13% of the population and only 2% of the national budget is directed to that population. That limited level of support, as you say, Dr. Weaver, it's criminal. Since one false idea is that the money spent on such people, and I proudly include myself as one of those people, is not well spent, it is vital for those of us in the community to demonstrate our abilities and our capacity to achieve in the vernacular, if you'll excuse the expression, to show what good we are. You know, let's let's review some of the special things that uh, which different people who, who had disabilities bring to the table. For example, a person with a different identity, such as might be experienced by those in the LGBTQIA community or the DID community, what do they bring? Well, they can bring a greater understanding of what it takes to figure out who they are, and it makes tends to make them more accepting of differences in other people. People with mental illnesses sometimes have a greater intensity as they're trying to discover what's real and may discover realities not apparent to people without this kind of thinking or problem. Indeed, yeah. It, it coming from a different spot and uh, looking at things differently in that way can lead to great discoveries, truly great discoveries. Um, Downs people to move on here. Downs people often bring a very positive and welcoming attitude to others, perhaps because they have to struggle so hard to gain acceptance and understand the world. People with movement difficulties like myself and Zach, I think it's given me patience. It gives people gratitude for the assistance they do have, which can amplify both positive and sometimes negative feelings. As a friend of mine says, it's like being on a roller coaster. But our physical differences can enhance awareness of topography, recognizing physical and psychological barriers, and this can translate into awareness of all kinds of barriers. I remember, uh, just very briefly, when I once traveled to South Africa as an undergraduate, my wheelchair disappeared, and I literally crawled through the street for some days, and you'd be amazed at things I learned from doing that. Yeah, we could go on at some length, but it seems clear that people in the exceptionalities community actually bring a lot to the table. Many people in the exceptionalities community have contributed to the advancement of knowledge and other improvements in society. To give one example, Mr. James Marston 
created a device in the 60s to convert speech to text. It's called TTY, so that hard of hearing people could use telephone. And that device has been of great use to all people. You know, that's interesting because when Alexander Graham Bell designed the telephone, he anticipated that this would be a, an aid to people with hearing loss. Um, and since that didn't work out as well, that is one of the reasons they did the TTY, which has been of benefit to a variety of people. Uh, and um, Mr. James Marston, as you, as you mentioned, he did, he did have a, an exceptionality. Another person we should mention is Mr. Joseph Friedman. Now, what did he do? Well, he created bendable straws in the 1930s. Now, that may not seem like a lot to you, but let you sit in, lay in a hospital bed and want to have something to drink. Uh, it's very difficult to do from an open glass. So you, having, having the <clears throat> ability to drink from a bendable straw was really important. And, you know, Mr. Friedman did have his disability. I was particularly taken by the story of a Dr. Francis Seibert, who was dealing with polio herself but uh, was trying to fight bacterial infections and discovered a protein strand that was used in one of the first tuberculosis tests, as well as um, a scientist by the name of Mr. John Hormer, who had severe dyslexia. But he discovered the first hard evidence that showed dinosaurs lived in family groups and cared for their young. Well... We've been going for a while, and as much as it's uh, very interesting, we need to probably bring this to a close. Well, may I thank you, Zach, for your participation today? You've really given us a lot of insight. Thank you for, for having me. It's been a pleasure to share my story with you guys today. I hope you find my story very encouraging. Indeed. I'm sure many will. Uh, look, we do thank you for joining us today. Hope you'll join us again. Um, while you're thinking about it, click on that like button, uh, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish. And most importantly, join us again. Goodbye for now. Bye, thank you. Hello,